Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you for coming here this afternoon. Uh, today we are here to uh, provide you our findings and conclusions in regards to an officer-involved critical incident and use of deadly force that happened on July 26, 2020. Uh, that uh, the involved agency was Salt Lake City P Police Department in involving officers Mansur, uh, Mansur Biaggi and Officer Wild's use of deadly force. That incident was investigated by the West City Police Department and the involved agency, as I indicated, was the Salt Lake City Police Department. <clears throat> and uh, so uh, uh, this was an incident that happened on July 26, 2020. And our findings and conclusions uh, were based on the, uh, the investigation matters that were presented to us. Should additional or different facts subsequently come to light, the opinions and conclusions that we uh, are contained uh, in my findings today will be likewise different. On July 26, 2020, uh, Andrew Jacob Priest and Emmanuel Valentino Montez walked together into the Smith's Grocery Store at 455 South, 500 East in Salt Lake City, Utah. Mr. Montez appeared to be intoxicated. At times, um, Mr. Priest held Mr. Montez by the scruff of his neck to keep him uh, standing upright. Store surveillance cameras recorded the men's demeanor as they walked into and throughout the store. A cashier at Smith's noticed that the men uh, entered the store and asked them to put on COVID masks on, but neither of them complied. The cashier called a loss prevention officer and a manager. The loss prevention officer uh, later uh, I testified um, that uh, he too had seen Mr. Priest and Mr. Montez enter the store. The loss prevention officer walked towards the men because in his words, quote, they looked like they needed help, end quote. Both the cashier and the loss prevention officer said that they saw Mr. Priest take out a large Bowie style fixed blade knife and hold it in his right hand. This is inside the store. The loss prevention officer saw the men wander around the store and then and he asked the men to leave. The loss prevention officer saw Mr. Montez steal an umbrella as he left, but allowed both men to leave the store. Uh, uh, the officer later testified that he didn't uh, uh, engage the men because Mr. P uh, Priest had a large knife and because the men were already leaving the store. Uh, he did, however, call 911 and ask Salt Lake City Police Department to come, uh, come to the store. The loss prevention officer followed uh, uh, f from a distance as Mr. Priest and Mr. Montez walked out of the store and into the parking lot where they continued to wander around and Mr. Montez struggled to stand. Uh, the loss prevention officer recounted how the men started fighting in the parking lot and that Mr. Priest hit Mr. Montez several times. Then the men wandered out of the parking lot and onto the sidewalk between the store and 500 South. The loss prevention officer watched as Salt Lake City Police Officer uh, Mansur Biaji arrived on 500 South in a marked police car with the siren activated. Officer Mansur Biaji got out of his uh, car dressed in a police uniform and addressed Mr. Priest and Mr. Montez on the sidewalk. Mr. Priest and Mr. Montez walked eastbound on the sidewalk adjacent to Smith's store. Mr. Montez held the garden, uh, held, uh, uh, Mr. Montez held the garden hose that the witness observed him in uh, with the store. Uh, the, uh, Mr. Montez walked in front of Mr. Priest. With his left hand, Mr. Uh, Priest held Mr. Montez by the scruff of his neck as they walked. Mr. Priest held a large Bowie style knife in his right hand. Mr. Mansur, uh, Mansur Biaji approached the men, ordered them to stop, drew his taser from his holster. So his initial response was draw his to, uh, uh, taser. Among the commands that Mr. Mansur Biaji issued to Mr. Priest during the incident were drop the knife uh, and hey, I, I will tase you if you don't stop. Stop right there. Hey, put, put it down, put it down. Officer Wild also arrived and got out of her car and approached the men. As she did so, Mr. Priest stepped behind Mr. Montez, grabbed Mr. Montez with his left hand around Mr. Montez's chest and with his right hand. Mr. Priest held his knife to Mr. Montez's neck. 
Mr. Priest pulled Mr. Montez towards him with Mr. Priest's left arm around Mr. Uh, uh, Montez's waist. Officer Mansur Biaji drew his firearm from the holster and called on the police radio, quote, he's got a hostage, end quote. Officer Wilde also broadcast on the police radio, quote, we've got a hostage, end quote. As recorded on her body-worn camera responding, Officer Wilde said to Mr. Police, quote, stop, put the knife down, dude. It's not worth it, put it down. I guarantee you, dude, I promise you, I, look, I don't make promises I can't keep. I promise you that, hey, look, it's not worth it. It's not worth it, dude. Officer has ordered Mr. Priest to drop the knife several times, but Mr. Priest did not uh, comply. From the body-worn recordings in our review, it appears that Officer Wilde fired first and fired perhaps twice before Officer Mansur Biaggi fired his weapon. It appears four to five shots were fired at Mr. Priest while he was still holding Mr. Montez uh, from behind with Mr. Priest's knife to Mr. Montez's throat. The remaining shots were fired as Mr. Montez pulled away from Mr. Priest. So it happens actually when we take you through, it'll happen very quickly, uh, but, the, but there are sequentially for us uh, two uh, sequences of shoots that occur, uh, shooting that occurs as one continuity of event. The remaining, as, uh, Mr. Officer Man Mansur Biaggi fired six shots and Officer Wilde fired five. Mr. Police, uh, Priest fell to the ground and officers approached him and secured him. The officers and other Salt Lake City PD personnel who arrived assisted with life-saving efforts, but Mr. Priest died from his injuries. The medical examiner determined that Mr. Priest sustained five uh, gunshot wounds. Uh, as, uh, we also uh, uh, looked at and received uh, testimony from multiple witnesses uh, several witnesses who corroborated uh, wh uh, what uh, uh, we saw, but it is also important uh, to note that there were several individuals uh, who did not. So the other witnesses, uh, uh, the investigators interviewed three witnesses who gave statements that at least in part were not supported or corroborated by the bo uh, body-worn camera recordings. We mentioned them here in the interest of completeness. But in as much as the review of the body-worn camera recordings demonstrates inaccuracies with these witnesses, we don't, don't rely on them for our analysis and conclusion. Uh, to point, uh, a DM, a motorist on 500 South who pulled over to watch the incident, did not see the incident uh, from a good vantage point. SC, this, uh, another Smith's manager who didn't walk out uh, on the sidewalk until well into the incident, provided information not corroborated by the body-worn uh, camera video. And witness EB and CB, who were passing motorists on 500 South as the shots were fired, stated they believed Mr. Montez had broken free and run away prior to, being shot, uh, prior to shots being fired. When uh, witness EB specifically said that she believed that Mr. Priest was shot in the back as he was walking away and the officer's actions were, quote, a murder, end quote. As mentioned above and discussed here as we talk about it, uh, that Mr. Priest was not shot in the back and officers began firing while Mr. Priest was still holding Mr. Montez by the waist with his knife and Montez's throat. There was a autopsy that was conducted and I think given that we had despair, uh, different uh, mentions there, it is important to find out that Dr. Kreibel uh, with the Utah Office of the Medical Examiner's Office performed the autopsy of Mr. Priest. Dr. Kreibel observed five gunshot wounds in Mr. Priest's body and recovered uh, projectiles from inside Mr. Priest's body along with several fragments. Dr. Kreibel uh, noted two gunshot wounds were to Mr. Priest's front uh, front right side of his shoulder, one gunshot wound was in, in the left side of Mr. Priest's chest, and two gunshot wounds were in his neck and collarbone area traveling left to right. Dr. Crabble found no gunshot wounds uh, in Mr. Priest's back. Uh, and it's also important to note that as we uh, gathered this information, uh, that uh, both officers refused to be interviewed by protocol investigators or provide a written statement explaining why each uh, used deadly force as is their constitutional right. 
without Officer Mansur uh, Biaji or Officer Wild's explanation for their use of deadly force against Mr. Priest, we do not know their reasons for their apparent decisions to fire their weapons. We are therefore left to infer the rationale of Officer Mansur Biaji and Officer Wild's apparent decision to use deadly force based on other evidence we received, as well as the reasonable inferences to be drawn from that evidence. In similar situations where a shooting officer has refused to answer questions or provide a statement, we have proceeded in this manner. And doing so, however, we have never strayed away from the objective evidence or testimony of other witnesses, nor do we uh, so here. While it is the prerogative and the constitutional right of an officer to not share information with investigators, an officer's refusal to explain his or her apparent decision to use deadly force does not diminish our duty to explain and account for our decision and conclusions or uh, absolve us from our obligation to the community to present the truth to the community about the death of a member of our community. So, uh, so that, at, at this point, what I would like to do is to show you the two videos that we looked at. There was a third video which was from inside the store on a handheld but it did not give us anything uh, relevant uh, beyond uh, the completeness of the two videos that we do have. So at this time, we'll take the uh, opportunity to show you the two videos that we looked at. Uh, and, uh, and, and let me sort of set the context here in, the, in, this, in this sense, that there is an escalation that is occurring here. So you have a disturbance that happens inside the store. There is an allegation of a theft that happens inside the store. There is a fight that happens out in the parking lot. There is the brandishing or the, uh, or, the, uh, or the presence of the knife which is witnessed by the officer as Officer Mensur Briaji uh, goes on taser. And then there's the taking of the hostage uh, that happens with the knife then being raised uh, to the immediacy uh, of the imminent threat uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the Mr. Montez. And I put that to you because that is an escalation that, is, that was what we noticed as we went through this process. And then in the context of when the officers arrived there, uh, then the, the continuity of that escalation to the decision to use deadly force. The first video that you will see is from Officer Mansur Biaji, uh, uh, who is responding. Uh, of, uh, and it will go to its completeness to the shooting. And then Officer Wild, who subsequently shows up after, uh, simultaneously there as well. You can see the two individuals. He's giving commands. Can you just it up? Yeah. Drop the knife and Hey. Okay. I will tase you if you don't stop. So. Stop up. Hey. He's got a hostage. If you can stop right there uh, for a second. Uh, ben, can you? Okay. So what's important here is that as he comes up, you notice that uh, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the decedent here is pushing uh, 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 Mr. Montez in front of him, uh, Mr. Priest, is pushing that. Uh, but at that point, the officer seeing the knife, but not yet in a position uh, which gave him alarm, uh, gives both the commands as well as goes to the less lethal of the taser. And what is important is that as Mr. Priest then moves and grabs, as you can see, he's got his left hand uh, up there with the right hand that goes to, towards the throat. He goes then from the less lethal to the lethal, which is the drawing of the weapon. Go ahead and play that out, please. Okay, stop for one second there. So what is important here is that Officer Mansur Biaji is to, uh, to the Mr. Priest's left. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, it, this would sort of in one, it's what we would call a loose tactical L. So with him being to, uh, to the right of Officer Wild, Officer Wild is to, uh, to Officer um, uh, Mensur Biagi's left there. And she is actually, when you see her, will be on the, uh, on the, uh, uh, the sidewalk. Uh, this gives them two diff very distinct vantage points, uh, uh, one from the right and one from the left there. Uh, and also takes them out of the crossfire uh, from each other as, as well. So the reason I point that out is because this gives us the benefit from their camera points of two different directional views of the same incident that's happening. 
And it's also important to recognize in the context that when we move to the immediacy of the uh, 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 threat of life uh, to Mr. Montez, at, at this point their training is going to be that they, as they make that decision, that they're going to look for if they cannot get him to comply and drop, and if that situation continues to escalate, to the, uh, the open shot that is going to present itself, because that is where their training is going to come in, because with the knife being at the throat, uh, that is one slice, a fractional move that can cut a very major artery, which can result in death. So you, the, I give you that context because when the commands are given, they're seeking the de-escalation of the situation, but they've also positioned themselves. They know that that necessity of that dangerous force is going to be as part of their training if that opportunity presents itself and uh, simultaneously the uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Priest does not start to de-escalate that threat to Mr. Montez. Go ahead. Okay, and the, uh, this, uh, so the next one that we're going to show you is from Officer uh, uh, Wiles' perspective. Again, in the previous one, as I mentioned, uh, up to the point where that hand goes up there, uh, the continuity of uh, uh, commands that are being given, and again, the lack of uh, uh, de-escalation from the, uh, the, 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 the situation that, uh, uh, the threat that uh, 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 Mr. Priest is presenting. So this is now from Officer Wiles' perspective uh, there. Keep in mind that Officer uh, Mansur Briaji is on a tactical L to the right of her at that moment. Just pause it for one second there. So what's important to note here for us was that if you look at Mr. Priest, who's facing us right there, his right elbow continues to be up, where, uh, consistent with uh, the knife being held to the throat there. And at this point, after having given multiple commands, uh, uh, at this point, uh, that threat is not abating. Uh, so you'll see now at this point uh, when the, uh, uh, when that, uh, the, what the uh, decision that Officer Wild makes. What is important to note here is that at the point that she makes the decision, the threat has not abated uh, to Mr. Montez with the knife that, to, that is to his throat, but at the same time, from being directly facing Ms., uh, uh, Officer Wilde, uh, there's a moment when he turns this way. Now at that point, she had to make a critical decision because that is an opportunity because at this way, the, the, uh, the body which is being taken as a hostage serves as the shield. Uh, to, to the officer's uh, 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 use of force at that point. And uh, so, so, based on what we saw and based on the, uh, the interviews that we did with the, uh, uh, the witnesses who were there, uh, both in store, uh, uh, one of the things that these, the store employees did follow, uh, there was, a, uh, there was a, a manager who had come up and they were all uh, corroborated uh, that, the, uh, that Mr. Priest had taken the weapon, uh, Mr. Priest had uh, brandished it, and then uh, taken uh, Mr. Montez. Uh, so they corroborated uh, consistently as what we see uh, on the video, as well as what they saw themselves. 
So based on that, uh, uh, the, uh, the facts that we sort of outlined, as we said, we conclude that those facts, together with reasonable inferences about Officer Mansur Briaji's apparent decision to use deadly force against Mr. Priest, would likely support a finding that, uh, that the affirmative legal defense of justification applies in, the, in his use of deadly force and would probably afford Officer Mansur Briaji the legal defense of justification. Because we believe a jury would uh, likely find that the facts and reasonable satisfy the elements of affirmative legal defense of justification and afford Mansur Biaji a legal defense to a criminal charge, we decline, decline to file any criminal charges against Officer Mansur Biaji in the deadly use of force. And for similar reasons, uh, and uh, we, uh, we decline to file for uh, Officer Weil's decision as well. So uh, based on that uh, review, uh, we find the shooting to be justified in the context uh, and the totality of the circumstances that were presented for our office to review. At this time, I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Yes, sir. Were you able to find Mr. Did you have statements from him? Uh, I think they tried to, uh, they did get a hold of him. Uh, we were able to receive, the, uh, uh, take some statement from him, but he was under the influence and heavily sedated at, uh, through the, some sort of uh, uh, alcohol and drugs at that time. So he was, you can see him running away, uh, and he was brought in, uh, but he was not able to give us, because the, the level of his uh, intoxication slash substance abuse was such that uh, he, was, uh, uh, he was not coherent enough to provide us anything relevant that we, uh, that we could rely upon separate from what we saw. Yes, Pete. Um, what we do know is from the observations that are made and what is communicated to us from the uh, folks who are inside the store. Uh, the cashier certainly uh, indicates that she became concerned. They basically looked like they were under the influence. There was something that was just not right with it. So she, uh, she was concerned about that. And so the, she, that's why she had co contacted out the loss prevention officers. And even the loss prevention officer seemed to indicate that there was some level of uh, uh, intoxication or something that was going on with these individuals uh, there. And so when he sort of steals something, uh, uh, their, their goal is to get them out of the store. Uh, and since they, uh, they, they refuse to put on the ma mask, uh, you can tell that at least Mr. Montez uh, was inebriated to a level where, uh, where uh, he's, uh, he's being led. At sometimes there's a question he's, uh, he's being held up, and there's other times that he's being led uh, by uh, Mr. Priest. And while there, Mr. Priest actually pulls out the Bowie knife inside the store and kind of sort of holds it and brandishes it. So as they get out into the parking lot, the loss prevention officers follow, and inside, uh, out in the parking lot, there is a, con a confrontation that occurs, a fight that occurs between Mr. Priest and Mr. Montez. The officer is already calling 911, so then they moved from the parking lot uh, uh, along the way up to where that entrance way is on 500 South, which is the one way on, on that Smith's there, and, uh, and then start to move down. The uh, uh, 911 has already been called. That's when Mr. Uh, Mansur Biagi, who's coming, Officer Mansur Biagi is coming. He notices them. They fit the description. So he's coming out of there. The one video that we didn't show you uh, uh, from the, uh, there were also witnesses. There's a loading dock on the Smiths back there, and that was open. So there were witnesses who were able to see from there, and there was a handheld sort of video that was there. The distance is uh, uh, a little bit further, but it does not add anything more uh, from the two that we have, and they sort of saw that multiple commands were given, and then the officers did what they did. But there was certainly a level of intoxication that we saw uh, in Mr. Montez well after even the shooting. What about just to throw off that question? I mean, would, would the autopsy show a high level of drugs or alcohol in the priest? And would that play into your decision at all? That you've got basically two really drunk guys who maybe don't know what's going on. So the question really becomes, and that's a, that's a good question, that uh, we did not look at the autopsy to for, for them in that way, or for, for Mr. Priest that way. The question for us really fundamentally is, at the time that the officer uh, goes to, to use that lethal force, what is known to them? And what is the basis on which that they're making the decision at the moment that they decide to pull the trigger? So, so there are commands that are being given, 
Uh, and, and I think what is instructive, and that's why I wanted to point out when Officer Mansur Biagi got there, the knife is actually seen uh, at, the, at, the, at the lower level there. So it's not that Officer Mansur Biagi immediately goes on gun at that point. His actually first inclination is to go on taser to the less lethal. And as he's trying to close that distance, he's asking, he sees that, he's asking him to drop uh, the knife. And, uh, and so it is only when the, he takes the knife up to the throat, and keep in mind Officer Wild is now pulling in uh, simultaneously, that at that point, he goes, okay, this, this has escalated from somebody brandishing a knife that I can maybe address through a taser or less lethal, and whereas this has now gone to the immediacy of the threat onto Mr. Montez. So he, 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 he take, holsters his uh, uh, taser, goes gun on at that point. And then what's important is the sequence of events where they're giving commands because they're saying, drop the knife, drop the knife. And at no point do you see him actually take the knife and drop the knife. The knife is still staying to the throat, and, and that continuity of that new uh, escalation, at that point, if there's an immediacy of the threat that they're perceiving to Mr. Montez, and, and when that opportunity presents, then they decide to fire at that moment, right? That's what we have, and that's what we have to look at. Uh, and uh, because what was also known to uh, Officer Mansur Biagi or Officer Wilde did not know about, at that point, the level of intoxication, the, the substance that they might have been in. What they were trying to do was to address the immediacy of the threat that was uh, uh, before them, and they're making their decisions based on the reactions there. And, uh, and so I have to take faith in the way Officer Mansur Biagi reacted with the taser and then I can also, we can infer from that why they escalated to on guns and why that decision uh, to fire occurred at the moment that it did. Yes? I've heard from other officers, and you kind of addressed it already, that um, they, they don't, it isn't, they're not, they don't have to wait until a threat happens to themselves before they use deadly force. So if somebody is threatening to kill somebody else, that also is authorization of deadly force. And um, using a human shield, that in and of itself, No, I think, I think you're capturing something very fundamental, right? Because the use of force is justified in the state where the officer may feel that threat to themselves or fellow officers, but it's not exclusive to that. It is also the, the necessity of that deadly force in the context of protection of other people, third parties. And in this scenario, uh, we believe that it is a rational inference based on the totality of the circumstances and what we see before us that it is not unreasonable that there is a perception of the immediacy and imminence of the threat to Mr. Montez with the raising of the knife, using him as a shield, and putting that knife to his throat, right? And again, that's why I emphasized the decision that Officer Mansur Biagi did when he first came there. He, he, he was responding to the level of threat that was before him, which he saw a knife, and he went first on taser. But as soon as that arm moves up and it goes to the threat, through the throat, it is a new escalation that occurs. And now they're responding appropriately to that. And, uh, and then they give multiple commands to see if that threat is going to de-escalate in terms of the imminence to Mr. Montez. And it does not. And, uh, and at that point, after multiple commands and the movements of the body, it is a fractional difference uh, in cutting Mr. Montez's throat. And when that opportunity presents, that officer's fire. So uh, for us, the analysis is at that moment that the officer made the decision to fire, is it uh, necessary and reasonable and within the four corners of the, uh, the statutory framework? And our conclusion is objectively and the totality of the facts that it was reasonable use of deadly force. Anybody else? Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, so I, at this point, oh, I'm sorry, there's an error, or a printing error, the 25th, not 26th, I didn't catch it, um, July 25th. And, uh, and so uh, that brings to conclusion our, uh, our uh, OICI uh, involving Officer 
uh, Mansur Biaji and uh, Officer Wild in regards to the use of force. Uh, there was also, I think, uh, Pat, you asked, so at this point we're going to shift topics uh, to another press release that we sent out today, uh, which was the, in the incident involving Officer Brown from Salt Lake City Police Department. Go ahead. Okay, that's, that's a, uh, so as you will recall that uh, we saw along with everybody else a videotape uh, that came from uh, the, uh, uh, the protest that had happened uh, downtown. Uh, and um, at that uh, one video that we saw that uh, showed an officer with a shield pushing an elderly uh, uh, gentleman down to the ground. Uh, uh, and at that, uh, so that was something that concerned us when we became aware of it. We requested uh, to uh, Salt Lake City PD that we wanted to review that. Uh, eventually those materials were presented to us and at that point we started to do our own investigation. We gather all the materials and we uh, sent our investigators to, to the, uh, the victim uh, to uh, get uh, the information about what he remembered, what uh, he experienced, uh, uh, to interview for our purposes for purpose of screening. As we gathered that information from, uh, from the victim, the victim also communicated to us that he was not interested in, uh, in uh, uh, pursuing criminal ch uh, charges against the uh, officer, uh, that uh, he did not want to participate in, the, in that, he wanted to move on with his life, and that's what he had communicated. As we gathered all of that information, we came here and had a screening team. The screening team uh, looked at all the information, the video footage and everything, and uh, through their analysis, they reached a couple of conclusions. One first conclusion was that they certainly believed that the use of force that they saw that was witnessed was uh, unnecessary and unlawful, and, uh, and that uh, the elements of a assault were met uh, at that point. But they could not also ignore the, uh, the other thing that the victim had indicated that he had no desire to want to pursue this or to be involved in the prosecution. He wanted this matter to be uh, 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 put aside and that he hoped that the agency would uh, take care and uh, uh, discipline him appropriately. Uh, I allowed for some time to, so a, a few, a, a, a little bit of time to lapse within that because they, as, they, as they gathered that information, the concern from the screening unit was that, uh, that, uh, that if we went to trial and we have a witness who is the victim of this, who is not interested and says that he does not want this to be uh, going forward, then we would not meet, be, uh, be able to say that we can meet our ethical obligation uh, that, uh, uh, that there's a reasonable likelihood of success at trial. So they, while they felt the elements were there, the desire and the, uh, of the victim uh, and his testimony in court well, gave them concern about going forward. Uh, I li allowed that, that to set and gestate for a little bit because I wanted to make sure that's exactly what the victim wanted to do. So then I had my senior, one of my chief deputies, reach out to the victim again in the last 48 hours and to say, uh, are you sure this is what you want to do? Have you changed your mind? Uh, and uh, where are you? Because we wanted to make sure that uh, that, that is exactly uh, the, his position. So he reaffirmed to us uh, his desire not to want to go uh, forward with this, his desire to not uh, to have a criminal prosecution occur in there. And uh, so I took that within the last 48 hours. And then, of course, we, uh, we as we do in most screenings, uh, we, if there's a victim who's interested, we share with, the, uh, with them uh, where we are as a result of that, which we did with him uh, yesterday. And, uh, and then today, we uh, sent out the, the decision that we did, which is to, uh, uh, so I sent a letter uh, to of, uh, Chief Brown uh, uh, with our declination and outlining in that letter uh, some of the things that we uh, considered. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned in our press release, uh, our concern is that, that this is not something that uh, should be taken lightly. This was, a, from our perspective, a, uh, a, a, an unlawful force that was used, uh, but at the same, and, it, uh, and it sends the wrong message as an institutional under the co uh, color of law, and, uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, 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 being victim-centered, to look at victims and to take their input and where he was, uh, uh, we also respected, uh, 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 after some good deliberation, uh, that uh, to go ahead and decline the matter. Uh, please, please. First question: To what charge are you considering? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, we were looking at uh, misdemeanor level assaults. Uh, potential, there was a potential that it could be a, a substantial bodily injury and also because he's an elderly person. So we looked at a series of charges. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, but it did not rise to a level of a felony, articulable felony for us. But nonetheless, assaulted behavior on the officer. Um, you know, uh, from what we gathered, he wanted to go, he wanted to move on with his life. One of the things he did indicate uh, uh, and, uh, was that, that when this happened, he, didn't, he did not diminish what happened to him. He did not take away from what he thought was inappropriate behavior there. But he also uh, uh, responded to the fact that other officers came up to him immediately and also helped him. And, uh, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and to be frankly, uh, absolutely be honest, my take on it is, uh, is that uh, this victim is a very thoughtful, genuinely compassionate person. And his desire was, while he, the, the issue needs to be addressed vis-a-vis -vis the police department, and he's hoping that that's what uh, would happen, he did not think that uh, he wanted to pursue a criminal uh, prosecution uh, to, uh, 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 against this officer. So, uh, so uh, uh, you know, as, as in our declination letter that, that I sent, I, I said that, you know, let's be very clear about it, that, uh, that uh, but for this vi victim, and let me be clear in the press release that we sent, exact same circumstances, another victim, this case gets prosecuted. And, uh, and, uh, but at the same time, giving respecting this person who uh, very thoughtfully and deliberately communicated to us a desire not to be involved in it and to wants to move on and does not want to see this happen, uh, we could not uh, ignore that either. The same sympathy that we attach to his uh, person because we see and we're horrified by it, it is the same person who's going to take, uh, go into the court and, uh, and say, I don't want to be here, and I don't want this uh, officer to be prosecuted. So we have an ethical obligation. Uh, and regardless of what we may want to do, one of the second part of our ethical obligation is a reasonable likelihood of success at trial. And so, uh, so, that, uh, so that was the dilemma for all the screening attorneys. On the first element, they uh, absolutely felt the elements were met. But the second part of our uh, obligation, that ethical obligation, and that's why I purposely sort of allowed this to gestate a little bit because I wanted to make sure that's what the victim really wanted to, uh, to have. Yeah, yeah. Because if I'm a defense attorney, part of our investigation is to gather that evidence. And part of our investigation is to give that evidence in discovery to opposing counsel. And if opposing counsel has evidence that uh, from a witness who says that this prosecution should not go forward, that witness is going to be compelled either through our case in chief or by defense attorney to go and take that stand. And if we don't use him and defense counsel brings him, and puts him on the stand, and he says he doesn't want this prosecution to go forward, then you can see that our burden of proof is going to be compromised and our likelihood of success at trial is compromised. And furthermore, you know, one of the things that we have tried to do as this office is to take a victim-centered approach. We talk about uh, the, uh, to make sure that victims are involved in that process because there's a sense of procedural justice that comes from that. And so we approach this uh, person, he is a thoughtful person, he's an intelligent person, and he's a deeply compassionate, uh, kind person. And, and he has communicated what that measure of justice looks like to him and what he, would, what, what he would prefer not to happen. So when we look at it and our responsibility, we reach the conclusion that we did. So a defense attorney can call of course. somebody because, more because we have created now as part of the record uh, his statements uh, and uh, what his desires are. And so us not calling him and then defense calling him, actually you can see even as I say it, how that would be uh, perceived by the jury. Any other questions? Well, yeah, pa yes, Peyton. Was this the only incident of alleged officer misconduct you were looking into from that protest? 
Uh, no, we, 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 you know, we've, we're looking at, uh, there's still some stuff that we've looked at, and uh, uh, there's a variety of stuff that we've looked at, you know, uh, uh, and uh, some of it we're acting upon, other that we, uh, uh, you know, um, I mean, we went through that analysis. There were many little c complaints that were brought. My point simply is that we've taken seriously everything that's been alleged, and we're going through the same kind of thorough analysis with everything, whether it's an allegation against an officer or an allegation against a person who might have been there, or allegations or citations that were given. For example, there were, uh, uh, you know, there were about 40 citations that were issued against individuals who were otherwise peacefully protesting, and uh, and uh, and as we uh, as they went through, and uh, order was restored. Uh, in my capacity as the Salt Lake City prosecutor, we dismissed those cases because the underlying objective of uh, Mayor Mendenhall's uh, curfew uh, order was achieved, so we were not going to achieve anything further by prosecuting those individuals who were in the process of uh, leaving the park but did not leave fast enough, I guess. You know? So we, we've been very thorough from either side. It didn't matter what, which side the issue was coming from. We're, we committed to uh, reviewing it as uh, thoroughly as we can on everything that's presented to us. Anything else? Okay, thank you very much.